Hello and welcome to another video review. This is Light Crusader for Sega Genesis, or Mega Drive, depending on which region you're in. This is an action-adventure game developed by Treasure and published by Sega in 95 for the Sega Genesis, or Mega Drive, of course, depending on your region, exclusively, although it was later re-released as part of the Sega Genesis Classics collection that is available on PC, Mac, Linux, PS4, Xbox One, and Nintendo Switch. And in case you're curious, I did record footage from the Sega Genesis Classics version of the game for this particular video, so all of the footage you'll be seeing comes from the PC version of that. Anyway, upon the game's original release, it did get a bit of a mixed reception, although it generally trended more towards the positive than the negative. In particular, the game's visuals got praised quite a lot back in the day, although the rest of the game was considerably more of a mixed response depending on which review you were looking at. So let's just go ahead and start delving right into this thing and find out what exactly we're dealing with here, how well it holds up, and whether it's a bit of an underappreciated gem in the Sega Genesis library, or whether it's something else entirely. And like always, we'll go ahead and start with the presentation, which is, as you of course have seen throughout this footage, as well as, as you might assume, given that this was released on the Sega Genesis, 2D pixel art, and for its era, it's pretty decent pixel art. The sprites themselves have a pretty fair amount of detail to them, the game is generally fairly colorful, although the environments can get rather repetitive after a while, because you are basically only going through a single dungeon the entire game. There are also some oddities with the animations here and there. For example, the animations for your own player character are just... odd looking. It's not that they're bad animations, but his walk cycles just look weird. It's like he's stomping around and throwing his arms all over the place whenever he's walking. And some of the attack animations are a bit unclear as to where exactly that attack is going and how far away from your character it'll actually hit. The thing is, that's not as much of a problem with the actual artwork itself. It's more of a problem with the fact that the entire game is from an isometric perspective, which certainly sets it apart from the majority of action-adventure games of the era, considering that most of them were not isometric, but this does have some pretty significant ramifications on the gameplay, which I will explain more in detail when I get to the gameplay section of this video. But for now, you just need to understand that the graphics themselves are pretty solid for their era, and they do certainly look different from the vast majority of action-adventure games out there at the time. And because the graphics were rather good at the time, and they were still 2D pixel art, they've aged rather well. This game looks rather pleasingly retro, instead of simply looking dated. But what about the sound design? Well, that has aged considerably less gracefully than the visuals have. The sound effects themselves are definitely not some of the better stuff you will hear from the Sega Genesis. In fact, some of them are downright obnoxious, like the really awful squeaking noise that some of the enemies make when you hit them. But even the upper end of the sound effects for this game are some of the weaker stuff you're going to hear on the Sega Genesis, which is really unfortunate. Moving on from the sound effects, you have a soundtrack that is certainly not one of the better ones you're going to be hearing on the Sega Genesis either. You see, a lot of people think that the sound chip in the Genesis is inferior to that of the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. And the simple fact of the matter is that somebody who really knows what they're doing with the Genesis sound chip can make it sound absolutely amazing. I mean, look at the likes of Streets of Rage 1 and 2, or the likes of Castlevania Bloodlines, or the Thunder Force series. They have fantastic soundtracks for a chip that is supposed to be inferior to the Super Nintendo. Well, the reputation for that really comes from games more like this one, where the soundtrack itself is not really terrible, but it's definitely not good. It tends to get very repetitive, and since it's one of the louder things you're going to be hearing throughout your entire time playing it, it's going to eventually get on your nerves. But then there's the one aspect of the sound design that might actually surprise you, given that most games of this era didn't have any voice acting. This one actually does have some voice lines in it, although it's just stuff like, Answer the riddle! So that just kind of comes out of nowhere and doesn't really add anything to the game other than a sense of, huh, that's kind of different. So the sound design in general leaves quite a lot to be desired, and when you bring the entire game's presentation together, you find that while the visuals have aged fairly gracefully, the sound design just doesn't hold up, and it really wasn't particularly good even when the game originally came out. So the presentation definitely ends up being a very mixed bag. But of course, no matter what the issues are in terms of presentation, what really matter here are the story and the gameplay. Except there's not a whole lot of story on offer here, so it really mostly falls to the gameplay. 
The idea is that you play as Sir David, a knight in the service of King Frederick, and you are invited to the neighboring land of Green Row to meet with King Whedon, who, once you arrive, tells you that the townsfolk have been disappearing, and tasks you with investigating, recovering the missing townsfolk, and of course stopping whatever nefarious things were going on. From there you have to talk to some NPCs to get an idea of where you need to go and what you need to do, and you find out that there is a cemetery in town with a secret passage that leads into a labyrinth. As you clear out the labyrinth, you'll be fighting various monsters and wizards and such, and gradually rescuing the town people who give you more bits of story as you go along. And while you may think it's a bit odd for me to go ahead and spoil this for you, it's really not much of a spoiler because they basically show this in the opening cutscene. But the ultimate crux of the matter is that there's an evil wizard who wants to summon a demon to enact revenge on the kingdom. That's basically it. There's really not much story to this game at all. And what story is there is not especially well translated. Now don't get me wrong, it's not like the game's incomprehensible or anything. You can understand it, it's just that it's like a non-native English speaker translated it, or they were working with some odd constraints with the actual hardware, like they just didn't have enough memory to go with all the characters they would need for a proper English translation, so you end up with some slightly odd sentence structures here and there, and a few odd word choices here and there. So while that does occasionally take you out of the experience a bit, for the most part you're not even really focusing on the dialogue or story anyway because it's barely even in the game, and what is there is just very shallow and very bland. As a result, you end up focusing almost exclusively on the gameplay, and that's where this game does some interesting things. The first thing you have to understand, though, is that this was running on a three-button controller on the original hardware, so you had some pretty limited options for what actions you could do. So the D-pad, of course, controlled movement. The start button opens up the menu, under which you can look at your inventory, you can equip different items, and so on and so forth. And then the three face buttons are used for activating whatever magic you currently have selected, attacking with your sword, or jumping. Now, of course, the basic sword attacks and jumping are pretty self-explanatory. You walk up to something and you whack it with your sword, or you just jump around. You can also jump and attack with your sword, or jump and cast magic. And if you jump towards an enemy and attack with your sword, you'll do a sort of diving lunge attack, which is a bit tricky to aim and doesn't always work properly, so it's a bit of a crapshoot when you actually start doing that move. But the really interesting thing about the basic mechanics of the game is the magic system. Now, like I said, you have a button for casting whatever magic you have selected, but the way the magic works is that you collect elements. There are four elements in the game, earth, air, fire, and water, and based on how you combine these elements, your spells will have different effects. So for example, if you just use the air element by itself, it'll send out a small burst of wind that does a bit of damage. If you use the fire element, it will send out a minor belch of flame. If you send earth, it will have the ground shake underneath an opponent that will cause a bit of damage. And if you use the basic water element, then it will restore some of your hit points. But once you start combining the elements, the effects will change. So for example, if you combine fire and water, you will get a cure spell that will cure any poison that has entered your system. If you combine fire and earth, it's a meteor spell, so it launches out a meteor that explodes. If you use fire, earth, and water, it will create an energy shield around yourself that will protect you from several hits. And if you combine all four elements, you get the judgment spell, which does some damage over time to all enemies on the screen. Every single time you cast a spell, it will use one charge of whatever elements you have selected, so you need to replenish these over time, by finding item pickups that are for those various elements just scattered around the labyrinth, or by going back to town and purchasing them from the shop. Obviously, as you continue exploring the labyrinth, you'll continue to find gold that you can spend in the shops, as well as various items that can heal you, and even additional weapons and armor that will, of course, improve your capabilities. The problem with this extra equipment is that the game does not do a good job at all of explaining to you what the equipment's advantages and disadvantages are, or if it even really does much of anything at all. 
And while you can certainly consult the manual for the amount that various items will heal you for, or if the particular healing item actually doesn't heal HP but rather cures poison, you don't get any such listings in the manual for any of the equipment. And funnily enough, when I started equipping the new items I was finding and realized that it didn't really seem to make a difference, I actually went online to see if I could figure out if there is actually any difference between the various equipment items, and I actually couldn't find any references for what those items actually do. There are two swords that will cast a spell occasionally when you swing them, but other than that, all the other equipment items, the armor, the gloves, and the swords, don't have any real data behind them. And that means whenever you pick up a new set of armor, or some new gloves, or a new sword, you're not entirely sure how much of an upgrade it is over your previous items. If you have damage numbers enabled, then you can look at the numbers, but you'll notice that over time as you continue to get better and better weapons, you're really not seeing any significant effects on your damage output. It's going up maybe one or two points per hit, and that's really not significant at all when a lot of the enemies you're going to be fighting actually have fairly large health pools. So the combat in this game, especially during boss fights, can actually get rather tedious. The bosses in particular have huge health pools, and in fact, when you start doing damage to them, it's going to look like you're not doing anything at all because enemy health bars are shown on the screen up in the top right, but when you're fighting a boss, it doesn't start going down until you start doing significant enough damage to them. So they actually have so much health that it goes beyond what the meter can actually show. Which, of course, brings up the question of why they didn't make the meter capable of showing all of the hit points that the boss has, as opposed to making you feel like you're not really doing much of anything to them when you sit there and whack them repeatedly and it doesn't seem to be doing anything because the health bar's not moving. It also doesn't really help that you actually do extra damage when attacking an enemy from behind, although you can't necessarily tell what that means for certain enemies like the slimes, for example. And that combination of the odd design choices with regards to the health meters and such, as well as the slightly clumsy combat implementation overall, means that the combat in this game tends to be fairly awkward, and as a result, it ends up not being very satisfying at all. Thankfully, it's still a passable combat system, so it's not like it actively encourages you to stop playing the game because it's that clumsy or anything, but other aspects of the game might actually make you want to stop playing it, like the puzzle solving, for example, which is obviously going to be a bit hit or miss depending on the individual player, but it's a staple of the action-adventure game genre, and this game has a lot of puzzle solving in it. And it's everything from basic, kill everything in the room and then the doors will open, to some pretty basic switch puzzles and moving blocks around puzzles, and even some really interesting puzzles with regards to being able to stop time briefly, so you can move things around and position them properly so that you can create chain reactions that will allow you to access certain things that you wouldn't normally be able to. And some of those puzzles are actually really cleverly designed and make you really think about what you're working with and how you can mess around with it in order to progress further into the game. And whenever you screw something up, you can just exit the room and go right back into it, in order to reset the puzzle and start back over from a fresh perspective. But during all of this, there is a major elephant in the room, and that is the game's visual perspective. As I mentioned before, this is an isometric 2D game, which means that it takes place entirely from a sort of tilted top-down perspective. And while that is perfectly acceptable for things like strategy games and RPGs and such like that, it is considerably trickier to pull off in an action-adventure game, and especially one that is very heavy on platforming like this game is. That kind of perspective makes it a lot more difficult to judge distances as well as heights. In addition, it makes moving blocks and other objects around a lot clumsier so it adversely affects your gameplay experience even though it looks fine from a visual perspective. Now sure, eventually with enough practice you can get used to it, but that takes a surprisingly long time, and in fact throughout my entire time playing this I never really got used to it. That's not to say that the game is impossible to control or anything, it was just a lot clumsier and more awkward than you would see from a straight up top-down perspective, or even a full-on sideways perspective like you see in most platformers. 
And it really does highlight why we don't see very many action platformers or action adventure games that take place from an isometric perspective and feature a lot of platforming and of course moving blocks around and such like that. It's because to put it very simply, it just doesn't work as well as a dedicated top-down perspective, so like a bird's eye view, or a side-scrolling perspective more like a platformer. Of course, what we would find out later on is that the best way to implement a sort of height or platforming into an action-adventure game like this would be to do it in full 3D, like say the Legend of Zelda series starting with Ocarina of Time. That sort of thing just wasn't really possible on a Sega Genesis though, so we ended up with this strange attempt at merging sort of 3D mechanics with 2D mechanics, and it just didn't really work very well. And sadly, some of the game's cooler mechanics, like the magic system, aren't really used to all that great effect. I mean, sure, you can combine the different elements to produce all manner of spells, and that's a very cool idea, but in practice, magic is just a way to either heal yourself or cure yourself of poison, or to cast a bit of a shield on yourself, or to just blast enemies with spells for a fairly small amount of damage. And all of those things combined with the game's rather short length, this being roughly a 4-8 to eight hour game depending on how stuck you get in places, means that it just ends up being a fairly disappointing game overall. One where you could see the potential of it, but the execution just wasn't all there. That's not to say Light Crusader is outright bad, but it is a bit of a difficult game to recommend unless you're willing to put up with the awkwardness induced by the game's perspective, as well as the game's fairly lackluster combat and rather rough translation. If you know you're not going to be able to put up with those, then you're probably not going to be able to get anything out of Light Crusader and I cannot recommend it to you. But if you know you can put up with those things, then you might be able to get something out of it. Just don't go in expecting any sort of masterpiece or even really much of a hidden gem of the Sega Genesis library. It has some interesting elements to it, but even back when it originally released, there were much better action-adventure games even on the Genesis, let alone the SNES. And with all of that said, if you are interested in picking up a copy of Light Crusader, I'll have a link in the video description box to where you can grab it on Steam. And while this particular game is available by itself for a dollar US, I would recommend getting the Sega Genesis Classic Collection on Steam instead, because you get a lot more bang for your buck that way. Thanks for watching, and if you like the kind of content I make on my channel, please consider supporting the channel on Patreon. All the revenue from that goes directly back into the channel, whether it be getting additional games for review, or additional equipment, or whatever the case may be. If you can't afford to or don't want to, that's fine, I understand. But the option's there if you're interested. Thanks again for watching, and I will see you all in later videos.